So it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the session, uh, Budhadev Hadra from Tate Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. And uh, the title of his talk is The Risky's Finiteness Theorem and Properties of Some Rings of Invariance. Please, you may start. Yeah, thank you for the warm invitation. So I am Mr. Budhadev Hajra, and today I will talk about uh, Jariski's finiteness theorem and properties of some rings of invariance. Uh, it is basically based on a joint work of myself with my uh, doctoral supervisors, Professor R.V. Gurjar and Sudarshan Gurjar. So again, good, uh, good morning to everyone. And let me start what I want to say today. So here is a quick outline what I want to say. There are two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will talk about something very classical, uh, which revolves around uh, like new short proof of Jariski's finiteness theorem, which uh, Jariski himself proved in 1954. And in the second part, we will see some properties of a certain additive group actions invariance. Uh, and here GA means the additive group K plus, where K is a field and most of the time, I will just assume that K is the field of complex numbers. Uh, please feel free to stop me in case if you have any question. I'd be happy to answer. Okay, so here is the first part. Of course, this problem uh, is a very classical problem, Jariski's finiteness theorem. But uh, before Jariski's finiteness theorem, it actually goes back to 1900. And it's all started by uh, David Hilbert. David Hilbert uh, in 1900 in ICM uh, held at Paris, he posed total 23 questions. And among them, uh, I'm today I'm interested to discuss about the 14th of those 30, 23 questions, the 14th problem. And it is celebrated as Hilbert's 14th problem. And this problem uh, asks the following. If small k is a ground field, let's say we are assuming that, and we are considering a polynomial ring, capital T, uh, which is defined over the same ground field, small k, let's say n number of variables. And capital K is a subfield of the quotient field of the polynomial ring containing the ground field, small k. Then the question was very simple. Uh, can we say that the T intersection, the intermediate field, capital K, it's finitely generated or not? So here is kind of a picture, which is like T inside quotient field of T and you are basically taking uh, capital K, which is another uh, subfield, which contains of course the small small field, K, small K, and basically you are taking T intersection K. So it is here, it is also here. And one asks T intersection K is finitely generated over the ground field small K or not. So this is the question. So in 1958 and 1959, Masayoshi Nagata uh, came up with his famous counter examples to this question. So this question has negative answer. Now, <clears throat> we'll little talk about Jariski's generalization to this Hilbert's 14th problem. So Hilbert asked about uh, the intersection is finitely generated or not, assuming the T to be polynomial ring over the ground field small k. But what Jariski generalized the same question, but replaced the polynomial ring by any affine normal domain. And by affine normal domain, I mean it's a finitely generated K algebra, which is a domain and it's integrally closed in its quotient field. So the question remains same, T to be a fine normal domain. And then uh, if you take the quotient field, let's say L and capital K is a intermediate subfield of L containing the ground field small k, then it asks that whether T intersection, the intermediate field capital K finitely generated over the ground field small k or not. So, so it is posed in 19, around 1953 by Jariski. And I will uh, come up with in the next slide that Jariski himself proved this uh, statement in 1954 uh, for a special transcendence degree of uh, capital K. So in 1958, in the early 1958, David Rees came up with his counter example to Jariski's generalization of uh, Hilbert's 14th problem. Just remember that it's 1958 and Jariski already 
by then prove the uh, special case uh, for transcendence degree up to two. And in this case, David Rees, after four years, came up with counter examples when the transcendence degree of the intermediate field is three. So, but his example, unfortunately, didn't work as a counter example of Hilbert's 14th problem itself. So, in late 1958, after the appearance of David Rees counter example, finally Masayashi Nagata could get a counter example for Hilbert's 14th problem. And in that case, the intermediate field in that setup, capital K, uh, was, had transcendence degree 13. So it's a quick review of the history of this famous problem. Now it's Jariski's finiteness theorem. As I mentioned earlier that in 1954, Oscar Jariski himself settled his question in the affirmative when transcendence degree of that intermediate field was less than or equal to two. And now in modern terminology, uh, which is actually known as famous Jariski's finiteness theorem, we will uh, use JFT in short in our subsequent slides. So Jariski's finiteness theorem can be stated as follows. If you start with an affine normal domain defined over the ground field small k, let's say the domain is T and quotient field is capital L. Uh, suppose capital K is a subfield of, capital K is the subfield of the uh, quotient field L containing the ground field small k such that this is very important, the transcendence degree of uh, capital K is less or equal to two. Then it says that uh, it is indeed finitely generated. The intersection T intersection, the intermediate subfield capital K is indeed finitely generated over the ground field small k. So this is the statement and everything, whatever I have said so far, it's very classically known. And of course it is known to many of the audience. But what uh, we did, basically, we tried finding a short proof of Oscar Jariski's uh, theorem. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't uh, prove the whole theorem with, the, with this kind of generality. What we actually settled is for the transcendence degree of the intermediate field, whenever it is one, we actually proved the same statement. But whenever transcendence degree exactly two, we couldn't yet uh, properly settle the whole thing, but we uh, we settle this statement assuming T to be factorial domain, not just normal domain, but it is UFD. Of course, UFD is a normal domain. So we assumed a slightly uh, stronger assumption and then we proved that. So for our, so our novelty lies uh, in, I, I believe that we, we actually used topological techniques in our proof uh, where Jariski used many things which are totally algebraic and his proofs are uh, substantially complicated to understand. Uh, in our proof, at least the case when transcendence degree is one, I believe the proof is not so difficult, but when the transcendence degree is two, of course, I believe in our proof also have some substantially complicated elements. So uh, before going to the, going to see the proof of uh, our uh, our state, our uh, proof, uh, let me first fix some notations because I want to use some topological techniques. So I want to assume that K is first of all, algebraically closed field of characteristic zero and all, all the varieties and morphisms, uh, they are defined over the ground field small K unless otherwise specified. And uh, some of the topological argument, whenever they will be using in the proof, I will assume that uh, the ground field small K is the field of complex numbers. So, uh, so here is the first case of this Jariski's finiteness theorem, which actually uh, asks about the finite generation of the intersection T intersection intermediate field capital K uh, over the ground field small k, assuming that intermediate field capital K over ground field small k has transcendence degree one. So this is our first theorem. Of course, this is uh, invented by Jariski himself. And the second statement is slightly different from what Jariski stated in his theorem, uh, because I already mentioned that we couldn't yet uh, fix the whole thing. We just assume we assume that factorial domain T to be factorial domain. So here is the second theorem of our paper. It says that if T is a fine factorial domain over K and is an inert subring of T. So I will define what is inert uh, in a moment and assume that that inert subring has transcendence degree two over the ground field. Then it says that this 
uh, in our subring is finitely generated over k. So, so all these kind of statements has uh, great connection with the invariant theory. And of course, we will uh, mention some some of the group actions and all uh, where this kind of inert subring uh, subrings do appear in practice. So I will mention uh, in subsequent slides. But here is the statement: uh, T is a fine factorial domain. S is any inert subring transcendence degree two. Then S is finitely generated over the ground field K. Uh, we will sketch the proof of Jariski's finiteness theorem of transcendence degree one. But as I mentioned, that the, this theorem has substantially complicated element in the proof. So I will skip it uh, for this talk. And before that, uh, what is the definition of inert subring? We can quickly look at it. So suppose there is an extension of uh, Noetherian domains, A contained in B, then this extension is called factorially closed or inert. Uh, if, if you pick any non-zero element here, uh, if you pick any non-zero element from the, uh, from the base ring, and suppose it has some factorization in terms of elements of the over ring B, suppose A equal to B1 times B2, then it demands that each of the bi must lie inside the ring below. So whenever there is a factorization of a non-zero element from the base ring above, then whatever the factors appears in above, they must lie there in the ring below. So that is the meaning of a ring extension being inert or factorially closed. So it has many nice properties, but uh, among all those properties, we have crucially used these following properties only. So for any inert sub uh, extension, A contained in B of Noetherian domains, the units remain same, A star and B star, they are the corresponding set of units. So A star equal to B star. And whenever you take the quotient field of the ring below and getting intersected with the over ring B, then you will get your base ring back. So that is the property of an inert sub ring. Okay. So uh, we can see a quick uh, consequence of this result. As a consequence, we can prove the following. If T is a fine factorial domain, and let's say G is either unipotent group, uh, you can take G to be GA, which I actually mentioned in the outline. GA means K plus, or maybe you can take the product of GAs. These are the examples of unipotent groups. So you can take any unipotent group or a connected semi-simple group uh, defined over the ground field small k, Suppose G act on T regularly such that the transcendence degree of the ring of invariant TG, I did not, uh, it has, uh, it is less or equal to two. Then the ring of invariant is finitely generated over K. So it's a consequence of our uh, earlier result and how it follows, it's a very quick proof here. Suppose the group is, as I mentioned in that statement of the corollary, then it has a property that it has no non-trivial character because uh, for the unipotent group and the connected semi-simple group, in both cases, you can see that it has no uh, non-trivial character. And as a consequence of that, one can prove that the ring of invariant is indeed an inert subring of the ring to begin with. So now we can just uh, use our statement, earlier statement, uh, which says that if it is an inert subring and inert subring has transcendence degree two, then it is finitely generated. In this case, it is an inert subring of transcendence degree either two or one. And the case one follows from the Jariski's uh, finiteness theorem, the transcendence degree one case, which uh, follows because of the property I mentioned for an inert subring, that whenever you have uh, the inert subring A contained in B, and if you take the quotient field of the ring below and getting intersected with over ring, then you will get the ring back. So quotient field of uh, ring of invariant TG intersection with T it is exactly equal to TG. So this is the uh, kind of setup we already have seen in the Jariski's finiteness theorem. So this is how it follows. So here is a remark that of course we have assumed something to prove the finite generation to show that it's a consequence of our earlier mentioned result, but it is true that it's classically known if you have any affine domain T with a regular action of any semi-simple group, algebraic group, uh, of course, any even any reductive group, then the ring of invariants is also affine. So by that, what I mean as scale algebra, it is finitely generated. So it is not just assuming a condition on the transcendence degree, it is of course finitely generated, but I just wanted to mention uh, as a corollary so that one can see how, it, uh, how our result can be used to prove something like that. 
Okay. So before uh, going to see the proof in the case of our proof in the case of transcendence degree one for the risk is finiteness theorem, I first want to mention that uh, a very key lemma which we have crucially used in our proof, and it, it is called a stabilization lemma. It basically says that whenever you have an, a chain of affine normal domains over any uncountable, uncountable field, particularly for this lemma, I'm not assuming K to be algebraically closed, but assume any uh, characteristic zero field, which is uncountable and consider a, normal, a chain of normal affine domains, uh, which must lie inside an affine domain S. So R1 contained in R2 contained in R3 and so on. But finally, everything is contained in an affine domain uh, S. So then because you have uh, R1 contained in R2, or maybe in general, you have Ri contained in Ri plus one. So basically from this inclusion, you can have the dominant morphism at the level of specs. So spec of Ri plus one to spec of Ri, uh, which are actually uh, affine varieties. And uh, these dominant maps I demand, suppose they are quasi-finite. So if they are quasi-finite, then our statement says that whenever you have such a, a chain of affine normal domains, having all these intermediate maps quasi-finite at the level of uh, varieties, then the above sequence must stabilize after a finite stage. So this is the main statement. So this is the statement we have uh, crucially used in both the cases, whenever the transcendence degree one or transcendence degree equal to two. But of course, in the transcendence degree ex exactly equal to two has many other elements to prove that, and it's very complicated. So I will not go into the proof, but of course we will see the proof of transcendence degree one, and we will see how this stabilization lemma can be used there. So here is a quick proof of our transcendence degree one case of Jariski's finiteness theorem. So it is not very difficult to prove uh, if you assume the normality of T, uh, which is of course given in the statement, then the T intersection K, if you call it S, then S is also normal. It's very easy to observe that. And of course, the transcendence degree of this intersection may drop. Even if you start with the transcendence degree uh, to be one, it can even have transcendence degree zero. So there can be such examples. But if it is so, then uh, we can prove that S is just exactly equal to K. And uh, so without loss of generality, and so finite generation follows because S is K. So without loss of generality, assume that transcendence degree of S also remains one. So S, uh, so dimension of S over K as vector space, it is actually countable. So because it is inside capital K and uh, a capital so T and T is assumed to be something affine. So it is countable dimension and thus we can find a chain of affine normal domains, R1 contained in R2 contained in R3 and so on, such that eventually we can assume that all of them are actually birational and the whole chain is contained in S. So we can assume this uh, further statement that quotient field of R equal to quotient field of S for all I and union of the rings uh, that equals to S. And the final goal is uh, we want to answer uh, the finite generation for S. So basically all the RIs are itself uh, like themselves finitely generated. So we basically want to prove that this chain must stop and because the union is S, so consequently it follows that S is also finitely generated. So uh, of course this R RI corresponding uh, corresponds to a curve in this case because the quotient field of RI and quotient field of S remains same and S has transcendence degree one. So this induces a map between curves VI plus one to VI and each VI is curves. So it doesn't matter if they are affine curves or not but they are of course algebraic curves. And for the map uh, for algebraic curves which is dominant map it must be quasi finite. Quasi finite means uh, uh, basically fiber wise everything is finite, all fibers are finite. So because all these are uh, contained in T and T is affine, so the whole chain is inside an affine domain T and the intermediate uh, maps, morphisms at the level of specs, they are quasi finite. So our stabilization lemma says that this sequence indeed stops at a, after a finite stage and how one can prove this finite generation of S. So any question at the moment? Okay, I guess no question. So, so I, I will move into the second part, which is very short uh, second part. 
So I will first recall some basics about the GA invariants, which of course everyone knows, I believe. So in this part, we will consider regular GA actions on affine uh, K domains. K is the ground field we assume, characteristic zero field, algebraically closed. Uh, is there any question? Uh, is there any question? Sorry. Yeah, I cannot hear you properly. Uh, no question, just continue, please. Oh, okay, okay, thanks, thanks. So uh, GA, GA denotes the additive algebraic group K plus. Uh, B is uh, any affine normal domain, uh, which is defined over the ground field small k. And uh, let's say GA acts on B regularly. Then uh, X is peg B corresponding affine variety defined over the ground field small k. Then the fixed ring, or the ring of invariance of this action we will denote it by BGA. So BGA denotes the ring of invariance of this G action. And it is uh, like it is important to note that BGA is not necessarily finitely generated K algebra always. So if BGA is indeed a finitely generated K algebra, which I call a fine K domain for a regular G action on B or equivalently on the spec of B, which is X, then the corresponding K affine variety, which is defined by the ring of invariant, speak of BGA, we will denote it by the <laughs> good quotient X mod GA, which is GIT quotient. And uh, we call that uh, algebraic quotient of the above regular GA action defined on X. And in this case, there is a map, which is a morphism X to X mod GA induced by the inclusion BGA inside B, the ring of invariant lies inside the ring to begin with, and it induces a quotient morphism, and it is called algebraic quotient morphism. And uh, note that, as I already mentioned in uh, uh, in the earlier uh, corollary, which followed the, as a consequence of our uh, transcendence degree two case, that whenever you have a unipotent group or connected semi-simple group, it doesn't have any non-trivial character. And because of the same reason, because GA has no uh, non-trivial character, BGA uh, inside B, this extension is factorially closed or inert. So here we prove, uh, uh, suppose we have a GA action, which is a regular action on affine N space, then the singularities are always rational. But before that, I uh, want to mention that Andre Tick uh, in 1998, he proved that uh, AN mod GA is Gorenstein, but he assumed that uh, GA acts linearly. So in his case, the finite generation was already known because of another result, which is due to Weizenbach, when said, he said that uh, if GA acts linearly on an affine space of finitely, or, or a polynomial ring, then the ring of invariant is finitely generated K algebra. So the finite generation was not an issue for uh, Andretic. So he proved the Gorenstein-ness uh, of this AN uh, quotient GA, but without assuming anything about the quotient morphisms, any, any statement about quotient morphism, he directly proved that. But in our case, what we have uh, basically proved, we didn't assume anything about the action linearity or anything, but what we have assumed that whatever the regular GA action you want to uh, start with, just assume that the, quotient exists as an affine variety. That means the ring of invariant is finitely generated for our G action to begin with. So this exists as an affine variety. Now we further assume about something about this uh, quotient morphism. We assume that the quotient morphism, uh, the image of the quotient morphism, it contains the singular locus of this quotient A n mod G. So it's a special case if you have uh, surjectivity of this quotient morphism. But I will mention a remark that in general, this quotient morphism may not be uh, surjective always. So uh, if a n to a n mod GA just contains singular locus of a n mod GA, may not be surjective, but just contains singular locus, then a n mod GA is Gorenstein with rational singularities. So in particular, it has uh, canonical singularities. So this is our result, what we proved in this paper. And of course, what I mentioned that Bonnet found an example in his paper uh, where G action on A4 but the quotient morphism is not surjective. But in his case also A4 mod GA, that was as variety isomorphic to affine three space. So here is our result about the rational singularity of this quotient. Okay, so here is a quick corollary. If you have GA action regularly and also linearly, which uh, T actually assumed, 
then an mod ga has isolated singular point at its vertex vertex means corresponding to the uh, maximal ideal which is irrelevant maximal ideal of a positively graded ring which is basically uh, this kx1 x, uh, x and ga so that is the only singularity here and then a n mod ga has gorenstein canonical singular point at the vertex that we want want to claim and the proof follows immediately because it is an affine variety because in this case we are assuming the action of linear uh, action of the ga is linear and it follows from whitesen box result and because ga action is linear so this ring of invariant is a positively graded domain and because it is a positively graded domain there is an irrelevant maximal ideal and which corresponds to a point which is called uh, vertex and only at the vertex uh, the singularity appears and also you can see due to the uh, because of the quotient morphism actually origin goes to the vertex so the singular locus is inside the image so therefore by our result one can prove that at the vertex it is canonical singular point so this completes the proof of this corollary now i uh, quickly finish by saying this so miyanishi had proved this result uh, in 1985 that a3 mod ga is isomorphic to a2 uh, where ga action is uh, something non trivial but we have slightly generalized our result by saying this it's not uh, a3 over the complex number but a3 over some uh, affine reg smooth curve let's say it corresponds to an affine regular domain of dimension 1 and you consider the ring of invariant rxyz ga where r is that uh, spec r is the curve c to begin with and the action is via r automorphism so r is inside the ring of invariants already then bhatodevkar sm bhatodevkar and daniel degle they have proved the finite generation for such s whenever r is inside the ring of invariant and r is of dimension 1 and r is contained in s induces uh, a dominant morphism from spec s to c so what we have proved that if this morphism has a point in c over which the fiber is normal then the fiber is actually affine to space smooth and affine to space and of course we have proved that near p not you can always find a small open neighborhood where this spec s is actually local trivial a2 bundle around that particular open set containing p not but daniel degle and freudenberg gave examples to show that in general this kind of no, uh, normal uh normal fiber is hard to uh, expect so sometimes it can have non normal fibers but whenever there is no normal fiber uh, our, our result says that around that point over which the fiber you are considering uh, there is a small open set over which it's a local trivial a2 bundle it's just like to generalize the result of mianishi and uh, here our corollary says that if all the fibers are normal then pi is a locally trivial a2 bundle so so here here are the uh, references one can quickly mention so bhatodekar and degels result uh, was to prove the finite generation of rxyz ga bonnet's uh, reference was to uh, give the counter example where in general a quotient morphism may not be surjective and here also uh, some example where they have proved degel and freudenberg that in general that uh, fiber can be non normal and this is our paper where uh, i actually proved all these things and here mianishi's result about uh, this a3 mod ga is a2 nagata's uh, statement nagata's paper is for this counter example to hilbert's 14 problem david trees is also for the same tick's result to uh, obtain that gorensteinness of an mod ga and also he found elementary proof of whitesen buck theorem and jariski's thing is for jariski's finiteness theorem which he proved in 1954 so i'll stop here so i guess i don't have enough time thank you